That is one of my favorite ironic endings in a crime film. Bob gets on such a hot streak, he forgets all about the heist he's masterminded. And he ends up arrested for a crime that actually never happens. But he gets to keep all the money because he won it legitimately. It's the sort of ending that would characterize many of Melville's films, where a wry twist was preferred to a slam-bang finish. Now, if you notice that Bob's hair was significantly different in the film's final shots, that's because it took Melville almost two years to make the movie as he scraped together enough money to finish shooting. Months had passed between the time he shot the interior casino scenes and the finale outside. One of the most valuable contributors to Bob Le Flambeur is its cinematographer, Henri Dequet. He had been a photojournalist during the war, and his first feature film jobs were as cameraman for Jean-Pierre Melville's first two films, 1949's Le Salence de la Mer and L'Enfant Terrible, made the following year. The unique combination of Melville's hyper-stylized cinematic sense and Dequet's preference for natural light and documentary realism would have a profound effect on the next generation of French filmmakers. Dequet became the preferred DP for such movie makers as Louis Malle, Claude Chabrol, and René Clément. And over time, his style evolved from gritty realism to glossy lushness. Well, style and technique aside, it's Roger Duchesne's performance that anchors this film. His presence allows Melville to employ all sorts of handheld camera work and nervy editing tricks without ever losing a fix on the central character. Melville's casting of Duchesne was not just a stroke of genius, it was an act of considerable diplomacy. Duchesne was a familiar, if relatively minor, actor in French films of the 30s. He was married to starlet Yvette Le Bon and earned a reputation as a high-living gambler during the Nazi occupation of France, running up significant debts with gangsters in the Pigalle section of Montmartre. His last film before this one was made in 1943. By that time, he was being used by the Nazis as an informer and interrogator for the French Gestapo. After the war, Duchamp was arrested and jailed by the government for collaborating with the Nazis. After his release, he briefly became a small-time criminal before disappearing entirely from public life. In the early 50s, Duchesne was selling scrap metal in the French hinterlands, eking out extra money writing crime novels. That's what he was doing when Jean-Pierre Melville, a Jewish member of the French resistance, tracked him down, offering him the lead in Bob Le Flambeur. It wasn't just that Melville was casting to type. He had so little money, he knew his shooting schedule would be horribly erratic. He couldn't talk any regular working actor into committing to the role. He needed somebody with time on his hands. Not only that, Melville had to smooth the way for Duchamp's return to Pigalle, where he was still persona non grata among those who remembered his wartime betrayal. When Duchamp looks at his reflection in a shop window early in the film, it's an authentic on-screen confession for all the world to see. It's safe to say that Roger Duchesne truly was Bob Le Flambeur, and the film would be nowhere near as effective without his self-revelatory performance. After this, there was nothing left for him to play. The following year, he took a small role in a French crime film called The Girl Merchants, but then he retired altogether, knowing that this film would forever be his legacy. Duchesne lived until 1996, when he died at 90 years of age. I hope you enjoyed Bob Le Flambeur and appreciate its distinctive blend of French and American style. It is the pivotal film linking Hollywood crime movies to the French New Wave, even if Melville himself was not part of that movement. Share your comments with us on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed. We're staying on the other side of the pond next week, but also returning to Hollywood. I'll be showing the last film made by Jules Dassin before his European exile, the London set noir Night in the City, starring Richard Widmark and Gene Tierney, a preeminent example of high noir style. I bid you adieu until next week. See you in the shadows. <laughs>